สวัสดีครับ Good morning my name is Jacqueline t r i d a l a third secretary from the t e w a b o n g b o r o p a k a n Institute of Foreign Affairs Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand I will be your MC for the today's program first on behalf of the co-host on the Thai side the International Studies Center or ISC a very warm welcome to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the first Thailand Spain Forum especially to members of the Casa Asia de delegation who are visiting us from Spain today. We also have with us today senior management of the foreign ministry, representatives from government agencies, universities, and private sector. But first, um, let me inform you about today's agenda. We will begin with the opening session with welcome remarks by Dr. Anuson c h i n w a n n o Director of International Study Center, and Mr. Javier Perondo, Director General of Casa Asia. Next, Her Excellency Ms. Busadi Santipitax, Deputy Permanent Secretary for, of Thailand, and His Excellency Mr. Javier Salido, Director General for North America, Eastern Europe, and Asia, and the Pacific, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, European Union, and Cooperation of Spain, will give their opening speeches. On the first session of the forum on the topic of geopolitical changes in the topic of uh, in the Indo-Pacific views from Thailand and Spain, we'll start at 10 a.m. This will be followed by the second session on good practices of Thailand and Spain in the tourism sector, opportunities for collaboration at 11.30. After the lunch break, the afternoon session will resume at 2.30 on the topic of promotion of the Spanish language and culture in Thailand and of the Thai language and culture in Spain. Lastly, Ms. Immaculada Riera, Director General of the Spanish Chamber of Commerce, will give the closing remarks. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Anuson c h i n w a n n o Director of the International Study Center, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Please, Dr. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our Spanish friends, uh, especially those who travel uh, quite a long distance to be here with us, uh, and uh, our Spanish friends here in Bangkok. Plus, all the Thai friends uh, who have joined us today uh, for this um, first session or first edition of the uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Thailand-Spain uh, t r i b u n a or forum. Uh, the forum uh, or the t r i b u n a was originally uh, the initiative of Casa Asia. Um, uh, they expressed the interest to launch this uh, with Thailand, uh, and we thank them for it, because I think it's a very useful uh, forum uh, in order to bring our relationship closer, uh, especially uh, among the Uh, at, at the people-to-people -people level. I, I think that's uh, very important. So after a few discussions between uh, the ISC, uh, the DVFA, the the um, Teo Wong v a r o p a k a n Institute of Foreign Affairs, the Embassy of Spain here in Bangkok and Casa Asia, uh, we agreed to create this forum, uh, and uh, aim, uh, we aim to take turn hosting the dialogue. Uh, the first edition uh, is hosted by Thailand, And we are here at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, for this event. Uh, it is well known that the, the uh, ties between uh, Thailand and Spain dated back uh, centuries. Uh, two countries established diplomatic relations in 1870. And uh, for today' event, uh, I ask the uh, our archive department to bring out the original copy. Of that uh, 1870 treaty, which is outside on display, uh, people can have a look at it. Um, and we opened our embassy in Madrid uh, since uh, uh, 1963, so it's been uh, uh, quite a long while already. And um, uh, I think both sides, both the ISC, d i v i f a and the Foreign Ministry of Thailand, as well as the Casa Asia and the Foreign Ministry of Spain. 
I think we hope that this forum will further contribute to the strong foundation between Asia and Europe and between Thailand and Spain. So I would like to um, thank uh, all the organizers, uh, both the Thai side and the uh, Spanish side, and uh, also to all of the panelists uh, from Spain as well as uh, from Thailand who will uh, discuss uh, three very important topics today. And um, uh, so I will now uh, give the floor to the Director General Javier Perondo from Casa Asia, please. Good morning. Thank you for your kind words, Dr. Anuson, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ms. Busari, Director General Javier Salido, Ambassadors, Ambassador Felipe de la Morena, Ambassador of Spain, colleagues, dear friends, on behalf of Casa Asia, it's a real pleasure to uh, host you, uh, to welcome you uh, to this forum. Thank you particularly for those who are accompanying us um, and who have traveled from Spain or from other um, countries in the region. Their effort to be here today shows their commitment to a strengthening bilateral relations between Thailand and Spain, but also to the kickoff of this um, uh, forum. Allow me, first of all, to share with you my satisfaction for uh, launching this first edition of the Thailand-Spain Forum, or Tribuna, a program that we organize already with three other Asian countries, which are the Philippines. Last uh, February, we uh, organized in Madrid the ninth edition. South Korea, this year uh, we will hold the 15th edition, and Indonesia. The third edition will take place also in Spain next September. And um, in this exercise, uh, we wanted to expand the basis of our tribunas, of these uh, fora. And Thailand was definitely on the top uh, of that list because of its key role in Southeast Asia and the enormous potential of our uh, bilateral relation. This meeting, as Dr. Anuson mentioned, is the conclusion of many efforts uh, carried out by both parties, and it marks the start of a new relationship, and I would say even a new friendship, with uh, the Devagonse Baropakarn Institute of Foreign Affairs, our Thai counterpart, and its affiliated unit, the International Studies Center. We truly believe uh, in the great opportunities that arise from this collaboration and look forward to keeping on working with you in the coming years. I would also like to thank the support of both ministries of foreign affairs, the Spanish one and our embassy in Bangkok. Their involvement in this forum has been key to reach an agreement with DIFA and organize this first meeting. And of course, our host, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Thailand, and its embassy in Spain for the excellent work done to make this project a reality. You, you are definitely the best possible host one can, can imagine. Just briefly, Casa Asia is a Spanish public diplomacy organization set up 20 years ago in 2001 with the aim of um, fostering the knowledge on the Asia Pacific in Spain and promoting relations between our country, and um, those in this region, particularly with their civil societies and public administrations. Throughout more than 20 years, there have been numerous activities related to Thailand. We have, for example, been offering Thai language courses for years, and we have included a range of Thai traditional dances and music in our Performing Arts Festival. I would also uh, like to mention the excellent and successful exhibition we carried out in Barcelona around the Thai silk some years ago in collaboration with the Siam Society and Ms. Canita, 
the managing director of the Siam Society is here today. We also organize lectures on social and political topics around Thailand and other South Asian countries as part of our regular program. The setting up of this forum is a great step forward in our bilateral relations. We will have a regular platform every year to address topics of interest for both parties. And that means that we will have a formal setting to jointly address the challenges we face and to channel ideas and specific projects of common interest. So in a way, we are moving from a phase of a scattered actions to an annual program meeting that we are sure will contribute to raise the profile of the Spain-Thailand relations and give content to it. I must point out that over the last years, the last few years, there have been numerous actors in Spain, especially in the economic field, which have suggested us the convenience to launch this uh, forum uh, with Thailand. So this exercise of public diplomacy is now a reality and is, of course, at their disposal of all the stakeholders interested. To uh, finish my welcome remarks, I would like to uh, stress the importance in these times of uh, geopolitical tensions to count on reliable partners with which we share uh, common values. I would like to mention the increasing rivalry between China and the US or the war unjustified and illegal in uh, Ukraine. So this forum is, uh, in these times, more necessary than ever. And we are pleased to have the VIVA and ISC as our counterparts um, in um, this uh, meeting. I just want to mention that um, I'm very happy I was posted um, here some years ago uh, as part of the uh, embassy. Uh, as deputy head of mission, so for me it's like coming back home. Eh? And um, I am really happy that we managed jointly to um, make this forum a reality. Just um, uh, thank you, um, and uh, of course I will be pleased, my team will be pleased to host you next year in 2024 in Spain. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Porondo, for the warm, welcoming remarks. And next, I would like to invite Her Excellency, Ms. Busadi Santipitak, Deputy Permanent Secretary for Foreign Affairs of Thailand, to deliver the opening speech. Please welcome Her Excellency. Your Excellencies, Dr. Nuson Chinwano, Director of the International Studies Center, um, Mr. Javier Parondo, Director General of Casa Asia, a warm welcome and return to Thailand, Mr. Javier Salido, Director General for North America, Eastern Europe, Asia and the Pacific, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, European Union Cooperation of Spain, Excellencies, esteemed panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Buenos dias, good morning, sawadika. It's indeed a pleasure for me to welcome all of you, particularly, again, to repeat my previous speakers, particularly those who have traveled from Spain to the first Thailand-Spain Forum, Tribuna, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of Thailand. I'm delighted that this inaugural in-person event is co-organized by the International Studies Center affiliated with the Tewawong Waropakan Institute of Foreign Affairs, or DVIFA, in collaboration with Casa Asia of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, European Union, and Cooperation of the Kingdom of Spain. I'm further intimidated because as I see my senior bosses and former colleagues here present, um, and um, I, of course, will make these uh, remarks very short and brief. I wish to take this opportunity to express my sincere appreciation to Casa Asia for initiating this important forum through the Royal Thai Embassy in Madrid two years ago, and my colleagues are also represented here. And I also wish to thank His Excellency Felipe de la Morena Casado and the Embassy of Spain here in Bangkok for supporting this initiative. 
This forum is indeed important as a 1.5 track platform, which will enable both sides to discuss openly issues of common interest that with an aim to deepen understanding and promote collaboration, as well as to identify further opportunities for cooperation between Thailand and Spain. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Thailand and Spain share warm and cordial relations as reflected in the close ties that exist at all levels. In 1870, our bilateral diplomatic relations formally began with a treaty of friendship, commerce, and navigation signed, which have certainly grown throughout these years. Our first contacts have been made much earlier than that. Our current ties cover multifaceted dimensions underpinned by strong historical ties, robust economic links, and substantive cooperation across the various sectors. While we continue to hold regular consultations on regional and international issues of common interest, our people-to-people -people contacts have also grown. It is welcoming that in recent years, the Spanish Thai Chamber of Commerce took form in Bangkok with a vast number of prominent Thai and Spanish companies on board. Furthermore, on the Thai side, the Thailand-Spain Parliamentarians Friendship Group has been established, which can help to deepen our relations. We hope that with increased mobility between our peoples, long-term relations can be nurtured across the sectors. This forum is convened, I think, at an important juncture, as most countries are working together to tackle key common challenges, whether it be to find a resilient and sustainable economic recovery from the pandemic. And here I wish to express our appreciation to Spain for providing us with the COVID-19 vaccines to help our people initially. Geopolitics and rising tensions in the Indo-Pacific, climate change, technological and information disruption, trade diversification, supply chains, situation in Ukraine, regional hotspots, etc. These are issues that are being discussed in different parts of the world with a view to finding common solutions through concerted efforts. As like-minded countries, Thailand looks forward to working closely with Spain bilaterally, especially also when Spain assumes the EU presidency of the Council of the European Union on the 1st of July 20 this year. With the signing of the Thai-EU Partnership and Cooperation Agreement last December, we hope that Thailand and Spain can deepen our engagement in many areas, including through the negotiations of Thai-EU Free Trade Agreement, which with its conclusion, will not only facilitate greater market access, but it will also enhance inter-regional supply chain resilience that can address future disruptions. Moreover, the launch of Spain's strategy for foreign action 2021 to 2024 also reflects the increasing interest that Spain has in the region. We note Spain's emphasis on the Asia Pacific as one of its policy priorities, and Thailand hopes to work with Spain to fulfill the sustainable development goals and other aligned strategies, including digital economy and Thailand 4.0, a value-based economy driven by innovation, as well as the bio-circular green economy model. I'm sure that these important strategies will also be discussed at tomorrow's timely political consultations between Thailand and Spain. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to learn that three key topics have been chosen for this inaugural forum, namely the developments in the Indo-Pacific, promotion of tourism, and strengthening language and culture collaboration, which demonstrate the shared interest that Thailand and Spain have in taking our bilateral relations forward. The Indo-Pacific region is not an only an important for global trade and investment, but it also possesses strategic importance to many countries. It can be another theater of contestation, confrontation, competition, or cooperation. For Thailand, trust and confidence, dialogue and diplomacy, as well as ASEAN centrality will be important in navigating these challenges, and we appreciate the support of Spain and the EU in this regard. It is in our interest to ensure that principles, namely mutual trust, mutual respect, and mutual benefit are strongly upheld to create an environment that is conducive to sustainable peace and prosperity in the region. 
As the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific and the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific bear many commonalities, we hope to deepen our cooperation with the EU and Spain in areas such as non-traditional security, high quality and smart connectivity, and sustainable development. Thailand also looks forward to Spain's accession to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia or TAC in the near future. On tourism, which is a common strength of our two countries, Spain is widely known as the second most popular destination in the world, while Thailand has received more than 40 million tourists in 2019 or pre-pandemic years. We hope that the speakers will focus on finding innovative ways to handle post-pandemic tourism. Thailand stands ready to share our concept of regenerative tourism that seeks to revitalize the tourism sector by focusing on holistic tourism management and approaches. Last but not least, in, in the collaboration on language and culture, which is fundamental for our long-term relations and mutual understanding. More can be done to maximize the spirit and the talent of Spanish learning youth community, such as promoting opportunities for internships at Spanish companies in Thailand or short-term work employment and language training opportunities in Spain. I hope that such programs can be supported, perhaps through the Spanish Thai Chamber of Commerce. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, with the vast experience, knowledge and wisdom of our distinguished panelists combined today, I'm very confident that this inaugural Thailand-Spain Tribuna, the first of a series, will produce constructive outcomes that would help us intensify our collaboration and strengthen bilateral ties between Thailand and Spain in the many years to come. May I also take this opportunity to thank everyone who has been involved to make today's event possible. Thank you, muchas gracias, kop ka. Thank you for the opening speech, uh, Your Excellency. Next, may I invite His Excellency Mr. Javier Salido, Director General for North America, Eastern Europe, Asia and the Pacific, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, European Union and Cooperation of Spain, to deliver his speech. Please welcome His Excellency. Deputy Permanent Secretary Ms. Busseti, uh, Ambassador's Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Depo Deputy Permanent Secretary, thank you very much for your very kind words. I think it shows to what extent we are aligned and like-minded countries, and how can we cooperate to face global challenges, like, as you were mentioning, global warming or, say, or the achievement of the SDGs. It is a real pleasure uh, and a great honor to be here in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand attending the inauguration of the Spanish Thai Tribuna for its first edition. I still recall the discussions we had on this issue last year on our political consultations meeting in Madrid. And I have to say that I'm very pleased to see that together we have transformed this project into a reality. I'm very com I am really convinced that this will represent a true upgrade of our bilateral relations. Of course, very special thanks to the two main actors that have made this possible. On the one hand, the Devabong Baropakaran Institute of Foreign Affairs uh, and the International Studies Center of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand, and also Casa Asia, a very important, a key Spanish institution in the promotion of Asian culture in Spain, a key partner for your embassies in the region. With this forum, Spain and Thailand are introducing a new platform of dialogue between business, universities, research centers, think tanks, and civil society that goes beyond the present government-to-government -government contacts. As it has been mentioned before, Spain and Thailand have a long history together that goes back to the 16th century, based on friendship and understanding. Three years ago, we celebrated the 150th anniversary of, of, of our official bilateral relations, and thank you very much for having this, that treaty uh, outside of, of the room today. It was a really interesting uh, document to, to study. Today we have built a strong relationship in, a, in which our respective populations also enjoy a positive perception of, a, of each other through enhanced interaction. On the political front, 
up until now, our key instrument, as I mentioned before, in the was our bilateral political consultations that allowed us to establish a common bilateral agenda on a wide range of issues, from political, defense, and security, to trade, investment, energy, and research. Also innovation, as well as education and culture. That nevertheless, we still have much more to do to foster our substantive relationship with concrete results. Our last meeting was in June 2022 in Madrid, and tomorrow, almost by the clock, a year after that meeting, we'll be holding this year's meeting. I am really looking forward to discussing with our Thai colleagues and friends in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs common agenda issues, as well as exchanging views on regional and global affairs. The creation of the Spanish Thai Forum Tribuna marks a new instrument on the political front that will undoubtedly enrich our overall relations. On the economic front, after COVID, we're also seeing a recovery from our trade and investment figures. I am convinced that in the coming months, we will be seeing new Spanish companies investing in Thailand. Thai companies uh, also are investing in Spain, and it's a very welcome movement. And we are also looking forward to enhancing our relations in areas like transport and in green and digital transitional transition issues. Tourism that will be discussed at length later today is also a key for both our countries, as has been mentioned. An area in which we can share our respective experiences uh, in the past, as in the past few years, there has been an increasing interaction between both our peoples and companies. We are very pleased with Thailand's constant participation in Fitur, a very important tourist fair that takes place in Madrid. As well, we are improving our cooperation in innovation, research, and development. We have ongoing projects in the area of circularity of plastics, rice cooperation, and sustainable packaging solutions. Last November, we signed a letter of intent with PMUC from the Ministry of Higher Education, Science and Innovation. We hope to see more collaboration on circular economy, clean technologies, energy, and energy water and environment, health and agriculture, and also food, food processing. To support our growing economic exchanges, I would like to highlight the, importance, the important work carried out by our very young and dynamic Spanish Thai Chamber of Commerce. Created only three years ago, it already comprised nearly 70 companies, and it's a clear testament to the renewed interest of Spanish companies in Thailand. Another area of cooperation is education and culture. We welcome the good cooperation we have with Thai universities and cultural institutions. We have agreed on an MOU with the Ministry of Education that enables further cooperation at the secondary education level. And we are also very happy to see that there is a growing interest among Thai students in the Spanish language. As this year, for example, Spanish will be included as an optional language in the university entry exams in Thailand. As a proud EU member, Spain is very pleased with the signing of the partnership and cooperation agreement between the European Union and Thailand, and also with the announcement of the relaunching of the free trade area negotiations that we strongly support. We are also supporting the implementation of the Indo-Pacific strategy in which we are actually participating. And we think that many of the priorities listed in the strategy resonate in Thailand, and we hope that we can generate new synergies with ASEAN's Indo-Pacific outlook. We are also looking forward to the Spanish presidency of the European Union Council that will start just in a few weeks. It takes place in a difficult context in which both Europe and the rest of the world are confronted today by the insecurity and instability generated by the illegal and provoke an unjustified Russian aggression against Ukraine. Spain has repeatedly condemned Russia's aggressions against Ukraine, as well as the illegal annexation of Ukraine territory. It is a flagrant violation of international law and the Charter of the United Nations, and represents a threat to the entire world. In Europe, the situation has enhanced EU unity and a clear conviction of the importance of a rules-based order and the international principles enshrined in the UN Charter. Spain, the rest of the EU partners, and other partners will continue supporting Ukraine to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity as long as it takes. We are ready to work with partners around the world, and particularly in Asia, to address the global consequences of the conflict, including on energy prices, food security, and development finance, 
and to increase the pressure on Russia to put an end to the war and return its troops to the international recognized borders of Russia and Ukraine. The Spanish Presidency Work Program will address some key priorities for Europe, like reinforcing the resilience through an open strategic autonomy, improving the life of our citizens through an inclusive and sustainable re recovery from the COVID and Ukraine crisis, and the reinforcement of the social pillar of the European Union. We will also advance in the energy transition to achieve a more renewable energy mix and energy security. On the foreign policy side, we'll organize summits with our Latin American partners and of the European political community. Finally, after the recent Indo-Pacific Forum organized in Stockholm, we will maintain our objective of implementing the Indo-Pacific strategy where we see many points of convergence, as I was mentioned before, with the ASEAN outlook. We'll host also a Board of Governors of the Asia-Europe Foundation, ASEF, in Barcelona on July the 6th. Ladies and gentlemen, today we will be touching on three issues of great importance, starting with a very hot topic on the geopolitical challenges precisely in the Indo-Pacific, as I just mentioned. In the recent second EU Indo-Pacific Forum in Stockholm, we had an opportunity to discuss on the needs of more cooperation to deal with the growing challenges that exist. The second panel will be on principles of good practices in the tourism sector, which is essential for both of our economies. The third will be a session on the promotion of the Spanish language and culture in Thailand, as well as of the Thai language and culture in Spain. I am sure that today's discussions will contribute to a more profound interaction between our two countries. Finally, I would like to thank to this opportunity to thank both the Spanish and the Thai teams that have worked so hard in the organization of this forum, as well as the interpreters and, of course, all of you for your very kind presence and participation today. Rest assured that I am already looking forward to hosting next year Tribuna in Spain. Although I know it will be difficult, we'll try to match the very warm hospitality that has been offered by our Thai friends here in Bangkok. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opening remarks, Your Excellency. May I kindly ask uh, Deputy Permanent Secretary Busadi, Director General Javier Salido, uh, Director Anuson, uh, Director General Javier Porondo, Ambassador Felipe de la Moreno Casado, Ambassador of Tha Spain to Thailand, um, Deputy Director General Somnu, the Department of European uh, Affairs, um, Mr. Pong Prat, Deputy Chief Mission of the Royal Thai Embassy in Madrid, um, Director Titi Pon of the Viva, Ambassador Emilio de Miguel, um, Casa Asia Director in Madrid, and Ms. Immaculada Riera, um, for group photo session on the stage, please. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now take a short coffee break. We kindly ask you to reconvene in 10 minutes for the first session of the first Thailand-Spain Forum on the topic of geopolitical changes in the Indo-Pacific views from Thailand and Spain. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Distinguished guests, we now begin the first session of the first
Thailand Spain Forum on the topic of geopolitical changes in the Indo-Pacific, views from Thailand and Spain. It is my honor to introduce our moderator, Dr. Valaya Jariyatam, fellow at the International Studies Center of the First Session Talk. I will now give the floor to Dr. Valaya. Please welcome. Thank you very much. Um, welcome to the forums. First session on geopolitical changes in the Indo-Pacific. My name is Walaya. I'm a fellow at ISC, International Studies Center. We are proud to be Casa Asia's counterpart today, co-hosting this event. Um, let me invite on the stage all the panelists, um, His Excellency Ambassador Emilio de Miguel Calabia, um, Professor Javier Chiu Perez, um, His Excellency Ambassador Sihasak, Pung Ket Kel, and Dr. Um, Titipat Poon Kam, Associate Professor from Thomasat. Please, I guess you can have a free seating if you like. Yes. Right, I think um, we're the first session, not because we are more important than other sessions, but because we, our topic is rather on the heavy side compared to the other sessions. Um, before we kickstart the discussion, let me begin by quickly introducing the panelists, uh, starting with our speakers from, from Spain, who came all the way um, from uh, Madrid. Um, next to, to, to my left, um, His Excellency Ambassador Emilio de Miguel, He's now ambassador at large for the Indo-Pacific, a very fashionable uh, department to, to be in right now in Europe. And uh, he's also director of Casa Asia in Madrid. He has a law degree from Universidad Autónoma de Madrid and has been in the Spanish Foreign Service since the 1990s, having specialized in Southeast Asia, having spent over 16 years in the Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand, where he was ambassador um, from 2017 to 2021, and where he also covered Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar. That's a full plate. And so it's great to have him back in Thailand, um, his second home, right, for the first Thailand Spain Tribuna. Um, our second um, panelist um, from Spain, Professor Javier um, G. Perez, he's from the Comilas uh, Pontifical University. He studied international relations at the Basque uh, Country University and has a PhD from Instituto Universitario General Guterres Malado in Madrid. And he has held numerous research positions, um, including at CSIS in Jakarta. He speaks Bahasa Indonesia. Um, also, he was at the Defense and Strategic Studies um, Center in Singapore and the Asia Research Center in the London School of Economics. Uh, he's been teaching courses on Asian regional studies and international security, particularly on terrorism and insurgencies in Southeast Asia. And, also, and of course, uh, and this is his first time in Thailand. <laughs> Um, right now to the Thai panelists, um, His Excellency Ambassador Si Hasak Phuonget Gao. Um, he's um, currently advisor, special advisor to the Eastern Economic Corridor, um, a project investing foreign, including Spanish investment. Um, Ambassador Siasak was former Permanent Secretary for Foreign Affairs here, and also at one point also acting foreign minister. Um, in his long and distinguished career, he has been um, Thailand's permanent representative at the United Nations in Geneva, um, chairing the Human Rights Council. Um, he was also ambassador to France and Japan, and also uh, he was also a spokesman for the foreign ministry. And um, not only that, he was a um, senior visiting fellow at ICS uh, Yushok Ishak Institute in Singapore, and he holds a master degree from Johns Hopkins. Right, and the last panelist, um, Dr. Chidipat Punkam, he's a leading academic in international relations um, from Thomasat, currently an associate professor. Um, he got his PhD from Aberystwyth 
university in Wales. That's my first time speaking Welsh. <laughs> and that's my, um, and a master from uh, St. Anthony's College in Oxford. Um, Dr. Chichipat has taught, commented, um, and extensively written on foreign affairs, including on Russia, international order, great power competition, and of course, geopolitics. Now, each of you will have about 10 minutes, 10 minutes each for your intervention. After that, we have one or two rounds of questions before taking questions from the audience, if times allow. Um, now, let me cut to the biggest chest of today, right now, what I would like to call the GI moment. GI meaning geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific. <laughs> it rhymes. No doubt these two words have dominated the news and the debates for for quite a few years now, many years now. And this, this time seems to be an extraordinary season for the Indo-Pacific. We just got the G7 meeting and the Quad meeting in Hiroshima just concluded. Um, we had, as uh, our colleagues mentioned just now, the Indo-Pacific Ministerial in Sweden. And um, so it's, it seems to be a, a flurry of activities around Indo-Pacific at the moment. So let me start with Ambassador Emilio. The EU foreign policy chief, Mr. Josep Borrell, um, the HRVP, he is Spanish. I cannot not mention this. Huh? He was former foreign minister of Spain. Spain is taking up the EU presidency this July. Um, and the EU parliament itself is having election next year. Um, and this is the last full presidency before the European Parliament election. And Spain just announced snap elections, also taking place in July. Um, and PM Sanchez just visited China. And so the geopolitical spotlight, if you like, it's, it's, it's shining quite squarely on Spain right now. So with your diplomatic experience in the region, um, and with what the EU is doing right now with its strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. Can you unpack this and shed some light on um, what's going on right now from the European or Spanish uh, um, perspective? Um, how do you see groupings like ASEAN, for example, um, through the European lens, through the Spanish lens, and how, how do you plan to engage with ASEAN given the current strategic context? ASEAN is our natural partner. Of all the strategies I have studied I, I, about the Indo-Pacific, it's the Asian outlook on the Indo-Pacific, the one that has more complementarities with the EU strategy. Something that I think we have in common is in the last year we have seen a securitization of the region. And yes, the uh, European Union wants to become a security and defense actor in the region, but it's only one, this is only one of the seven priorities of our strategy. Um, I would like to, may I start now my speak, my lecture? Well, I would like now to focus on the changes we have uh, seen in the last uh, year and a half that have changed really all the situation in the region. To start, we have the war in Ukraine, which is having an impact in the Indo-Pacific. China and Russia have reinforced their military cooperation. NATO has strengthened its links with the AP4, Republic of Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. AUKUS announced its first initiative, the provision of nuclear submarines to Australia. Japan is changing its traditional stand, aiming to become a more relevant actor in security and defense in the region. And India is overgrowing its traditional role of a regional power. As I mentioned, security and defense have become a priority in the region. One of the seven priorities of the EU strategy is to become an actor in security and defense in the region. The EU intends to reach this aim through joining the main security and defense fora in the region and through its programs Crimario II and ESIWA. Nevertheless, 
We don't want the securitization of the region. We don't want that everything in the region is seen through the security lenses. Second, we have the rivalry between US and China that has deepened in the last year and is tainting all the developments in the region. I don't think anybody wants to take sides, even if we can have more common interests with one or the other. When two elephants fight, the grass suffers. The EU strategy is based in cooperation and partnerships. Obviously, partnerships are not one size fits all. The strategy uh, grades these partnerships according to the closeness and past collaboration with each different partner. A third event in the last year and a half is that RCEP entered into force. It is the largest FTA outside of the WTO and may become a super game changer in the region. Nevertheless, to attain this, it has to avoid two pitfalls, the security of the supply chains and the geopolitical rivalries and the securitization of the Indo-Pacific that I mentioned before. US on its side has launched the Indo-Pacific Economic uh, Framework, which is much less than a free trade agreement. Nevertheless, its ambition is large to set the standards for quality growth. EU strategy has bet on quality free trade agreements with our partners. The FTA with New Zealand was fin finalized last year, and we are close to finalization of the FTA with Australia. FTA negotiations with India have resumed, and negotiations with several Asian countries, Thailand among them, are progressing. Another change has been about the Southern Pacific. Southern Pacific has become an, ar an arena of geopolitical rivalry. Traditionally, the Pacific Island states grouped in the Pacific Island Forum were pro-Western. In the last years, China has made some inroads in infrastructure and fisheries. Um, last year, visit of then Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi to the region and the signing of a security agreement between with Solomon Islands created some concern. US launched the Partners in the Blue Pacific Initiative. EU, on its part, we want to continue providing the needs of the Indo-Pacific for their development. The Indo-Pacific, excuse me, the Southern Pacific is one area that suffers of many vulnerabilities. Vulnerability to climate change, lack of human resources, problems with the public health uh, systems, and so on. The EU, EU wants to reinforce its partnership with the Pacific region through the partnership agreement that will succeed the Cotonou Agreement. Besides this, the EU is a partner of the region through its cooperation with the Pacific Island Forum. In the last year, the EU has increased its engagement with the Pacific Island states. Crimario II, the program that aims to control the re to increase their control of riparian states over the territorial waters, is being extended to the Southern Pacific. Of the projects announced last March by Global Gateway, four will be in the, in the Southern Pacific. Another uh, area where things have changed in the last year is the Belt and Road Initiative connectivity. The Belt and Road Initiative was right to detect the lack of infrastructures connecting Eurasia and was able to mobilize important funding to build them. Nevertheless, after the pandemic, BRI has lost part, past, part of its input, impetus. Chinese financial means are not what they used to be in 2013. Some of the BRI beneficiary countries are heavily indebted. The sustainability of some of the projects has been put, put, put into doubt. The EU has consistently defended a connectivity model which is financially, socially, and environmentally sustainable. With this idea in mind, in December 2021, EU launched Global Gateway in order to finance connectivity projects that, uh, that answer to this philosophy. Last March, the first flagship projects were announced. 16 of them will be in Asia Pacific. Global Gateway is inclusive and open to partnerships, and it doesn't try to rival with any other connectivity models. 
Finally, last year we have witnessed the speeding up of climate change. Vanuatu had two cyclones back to back this March. Last September, heat wave was followed in Pakistan by floods that covered a third of the country. More floods are expected this year. This year, also a lengthy heat wave has hit a great part of continental ASEAN, including Thailand. Europe had its own heat wave last summer, and it's likely we will experience another this year. Climate change is one transversal issue that informs the whole EU strategy. Prior priority one speaks of sustainable pros prosperity. Priority two is about green transition and clean energy and transport. Priority six speaks of human security and highlights the importance of adaptation, mitigation, and preparedness to climate change. I have mentioned the main changes we have seen in the Indo-Pacific in the last year and a half, and which are answers that, and the answers that the EU strategy offers. I would like to finalize showing how the EU and ASEAN could and should cooperate more in the Indo-Pacific. To start, both of us share the same view of the Indo-Pacific, free, open, inclusive, transparent, and rules-based. The Asian outlook on the Indo-Pacific is the strategy of those that have been issued that presents more complementarities with the EU strategy. The areas where we should increase our cooperation, in my opinion, are first, digital partnerships, the importance of e-trade, the importance of ensuring the free flow of data, and the protection of intimacy of the persons are important parts of digital partnerships. In the present, the European Union have find, has signed three digital partnerships with the Republic of Korea, Japan, and Singapore. And I think that it's something we should also promote with the different Asian countries. In second place, maritime security. Uh, ASEAN being where the home to the Straits of Malacca, I think you are as, as worried as we are about uh, maritime, ensuring maritime security. The main maritime securities, security, maritime routes in the, region, in the world cross the Indo-Pacific. Both of us are interested in the respect of UNCLOS and ensuring the security of these routes against piracy, against human trafficking, against IUU fishing. It's a, a, an area where I think uh, cooperation is imperative. And then we have climate change, which I have also mentioned. And I think ASEAN is one of the regions in the world most affected by climate change. We have been best of partners for the last 45 years. We, uh, we celebrated last year a very important summit between ASEAN and European Union. We share the same aspirations and we sh should be partners to build the kind of Indo-Pacific we want. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for a very broad sweep and very useful exposition of the Indo-Pacific theater. You mentioned so many things that could, we could broaden um, in our discussion. Um, you mentioned, um, as you know, um, NATO, I mean, setting up, I mean, offices, I mean, in increasing cooperation in the North, uh, North Asian countries. Um, also, the, um, the global gateway as perhaps the um, European offer, um, alternative, if you like. Um, I'm not so sure. And, um, and also, of course, the EU has made references to the Indo-Pacific, even about naval patrol in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so all these issues are, of course, uh, very interesting. Um, but I think to understand more, we need ASEAN perspective on, on these things as well. So I can, can I turn to Ambassador Sihasak um, to share his views about the Indo-Pacific um, coming from, um, I mean, how, how, how does the region, Southeast Asia, ASEAN, see the Indo-Pacific? Because it's largely a Western construct, I mean, 
for, for the time being. So, so how do you, what's your take on, on this? What's well, thank you very much, Kun Walaya. And it's a great pleasure for me to, to be here at, at this important conference. Of course, I, I'm obliged to offer a Thai perspective on the Indo-Pacific, which I think it's largely also an ASEAN perspective. But I can go further than that because as a retired diplomat, <laughs> I can afford to be frank and, and candid. <laughs> but I recall that when I was ambassador to France five years ago, and uh, the current ambassador to France was the Director General for Asia at Kedose. And he talked with me a lot about the Indo-Pacific and eventually France became the first country to have an Indo-Pacific strategy followed by Germany, the Netherlands, and EU. The point I'd like to make is I think, you know, EU has tremendous stakes in peace, stability, and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific and certainly we'd like to see a more construct a constructive, pivotal role on the part of the EU in the Indo-Pacific, in helping to shape the Indo-Pacific in a way that we will become more stable, more peaceful, and more prosperous. Now, I, I'd like to, I have about 10 minutes. Am I correct? Okay. I'd like to talk about, uh, a little bit about the origin of the Indo-Pacific concept, and then talk about the challenges that we face and how I see the way forward. Now, the term Indo-Pacific actually became popular about a decade ago. Before, before that, we talked about Asia Pacific. Uh, I think my former boss, Kun Pradap, is here. When we were in Washington together at that time, the Americans were talking about the Pacific century. And then, of course, then there's East Asia and the Pacific. But then we have this new terminology, the Indo-Pacific. And we have many countries coming out with their respective Indo-Pacific strategy. Countries in Europe, countries in, in the region. But the point that I like to make is that well, these strategies, we have many Indo-Pacific strategy. On surface, they may look the same, but actually they're not one and the same. And so we have to discern the nuances of each strategy. Now the Chinese don't use this term because it's very obnoxious to them. Because for them, Indo-Pacific, especially the Indo-Pacific strategy as advanced by the United States, means the containment and perhaps the isolation of China. Now, ASEAN is somewhere in between. You know, we use Asia Pacific, sometimes we use uh, Indo-Pacific. But, but we have also our own version, which is the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, which places emphasis on free, open, rules-based, and importantly, inclusivity. Um, why Indo-Pacific? I think we must clear, be clear as to the origin. I, I think, to me, it reflects the rise of India. India as an economic powerhouse. India as a player in the balance of power in the region. And some would say India helping to contain China a little bit. But the, the, other, the, rea the other reality is that the two oceans, and this is advanced by Prime Minister Abe of Japan, you know, the confluence of the two oceans, meaning that two oceans represents one strategic domain. I think that's important. And of course, and I think, but what is important and implicit in many countries' Indo-Pacific strategy is the concern about the rise of China and how do we deal with the rise of China. And so for all these reasons, 
This is the dilemma that we face in the, in the Indo-Pacific. First, it's a region of immense economic potential. You know, 60% um, of the world's GDP originates from the Indo-Pacific. We've become the, more or less the center of gravity of the global economy. But at the same time, this is the region where geopolitical rivalries are being played out. Uh, you have uh, relations between China and Japan, China and India, but the most important relationship and the most uh, contentious geopolitical rivalry is, of course, between the United States and China. And so how do we balance all this? How do we steer ourselves through these challenges? I know one thing. You know, we, it, our European colleagues uh, talked about Ukraine. Ukraine provides valuable lessons for us. It means that, you know, the fragility of peace, how we need to carefully navigate the geopolitical competition among the major powers. I think these are lessons that we in Thailand and we in ASEAN draw from what is happening in Ukraine. And how do we navigate you know, the geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific? Of course, uh, for ASEAN, we're under pressure to take sides. We, we cannot take sides, of course. But that doesn't mean we cannot take a stand. Because I, I think there's no room for just being neutral. There's no room for taking a policy of equidistance. You know, we have to have a kind of proactive uh, neutrality, let's say. So we, we have to take side, depending on where, what is in our interest, what, what is consistent with the principles that we adhere to. But for us, the reality is one thing. We cannot go against China, because China is the reality in the region China is the resident superpower. China will never go away. Every day we wake up, we deal with the reality of China. So, but I'm always reminded with what, and maybe a little, uh, perhaps, uh, well, it's not so confidential, I think it's been, but I'm reminded of what I was told by my Vietnamese colleague a few years back. He told me that whoever aspires to be the leader of Vietnam must be capable of doing two things. First, live with China. Second, stand up to China. And this is applicable to all the countries in the region. And that is why we need the United States to help provide the balance of power. But at the same time, we cannot join the United States in this you know, free and open, Indo-Pacific strategy of containing China. We, we simply cannot do that, you know, because uh, China, again, is the power that we have to live with every day. And so we're a little bit concerned about, you know, this kind of the, the reinforcement of alliances, the new structures that are being created, which, is, which are principally uh, based um, on security and military cooperation, such as the, the Quad and AUKUS. What we like to see is a, mo a more positive engagement by the United States, especially in the economic field, economic, more economic engagement of the United States. Yes, we have IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, but it's still very thin. You know? <laughs> It's a work in progress, and it doesn't really address the, the interests and needs of countries in the region in terms of market access, trade, and so I, I think that that's, well, but anyway, the United States should you know, play a greater role, take on leadership in terms of economic engagement. I also believe that geopolitics 
should drive geo geoeconomics should drive geopolitics. Because if we can trade more, if we can invest more, if we have more economic integration, like the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, I think you know we benefit from the economic partnerships, relationships. And there, there, this helps to moderate sources of conflict. And when you're locked in this kind of mutually beneficial relations, I think there's no reason to go to war. So I, I hope you know, that we can concentrate on the opportunities that exist in the region for more economic cooperation. Third point going forward is ASEAN centrality. Now, ASEAN centrality is acceptable to everyone. But the problem is that we haven't been able to act on our centrality at, at all because of lack of unity, cohesion, and relevance on the part of ASEAN. And really, this ASEAN really have, has to get its act together. You know, I recall, you know, when I was a young diplomat, ASEAN, the ASEAN countries were working together to defend the peace and stability of the region. That's not the case anymore because each of us have different perception of regional security, different levels of relationship with the major powers. And most importantly, what has guided ASEAN you know, since the very beginning, and I still believe it's relevant, is this concept of national and regional resilience, meaning that national interests and regional interests have to go together. But nowadays, every country is thinking in terms of their national interest rather than regional interest. So the saying that you probably hear often is that ASEAN has to hang together or each of us will be hung individually. And, and that still applies. So ASEAN centrality is important in shaping the, the direction of the Indo-Pacific region. We have the ASEAN outlook, but it's been a lot of talk. We haven't been flesh, able to flesh out our thinking on what it is and the areas of cooperation. So I, I hope that ASEAN can do more. Third, a fourth is about the EU. What we like to see in terms of a regional order in the Indo-Pacific is a multipolar regional order. And so EU can contribute to this multipolar regional order. And uh, there are so many areas, I, I, I think you've outlined already, where, where we can cooperate. Connectivity, trade, cl climate change, freedom of navigation, respect for the rules-based international order. These areas that we can cooperate for mutual benefit. And of course, I think, you know, um, for you it's about shared values also. You, know, you shared uh, values of democracy, human rights. Uh, the United States, of course, uh, with Western countries. But what is important, and I want to emphasize this, is you have to maintain your strategic autonomy. You know, you are part of the Western Alliance, yes. But Indo in the Indo-Pacific region, because we want to see a multipolar regional order, we would like EU to be more engaged substantively in all these areas. Plus, we'd like to see the, U the EU maintain its strategic autonomy. Now, in the end, all this depends on the US and China. How do they handle their relationship? You know, and I, I, I really feel that, you know, having dealt with China at a fairly high level, I, I know that China can be very assertive when it comes to their core interests. And when we talk about wolf warrior diplomacy, I've, I've observed that firsthand before. So I think China has to be more sensitive to the concerns of regional countries. And uh, at the same time, I think the United States also has to be sensitive to the need for us to live with China. We, we have to live with China. U.S. also has to live with China eventually. And so I, I'm concerned about this China fear mongering in the United States 
because this is not the way to go. We don't need another Ukraine in, in our region. You know, we know we, we have to handle this, but I think all the, you know, the major powers, the external powers should help us, help countries in the region to steer this very, you know, to navigate the challenge of geopolitics in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for a very thorough, thorough and deep analysis of the um, um, geopolitics in the region. You mentioned so many things that we're still struggling to find um, conclusions, closure, answers. Um, so may I turn now to um, Professor um, Javier Perez um, to alternate to the uh, European views. Um, we see right now the U.S. AUKUS, as Ambassador mentioned, investing in defense capabilities in the region. We see the EU talking about strategic autonomy. Um, and we don't know yet about the two elephants in the Indo-Pacific, China and the U.S., um, how they're going to double down on, on the agenda. Um, do you share um, the views of um, Ambassador Siasak, I mean, coming from Europe and having um, lived in, in Southeast Asia, you know about the ASEAN perception of security. Um, do you think that um, this is a, we can still hold out hope for the European um, moderating the views, I mean, the competition and the rivalry between US and China? Do you think the, the European can offer um, something um, that would calm down the, um, the tension? Because um, as I mentioned, um, President Macron and um, also President von der Leyen just went to China and they seem to be sending different messages um, about Indo-Pacific. What is your take on this? Well, uh, first, I would like to express my uh, gratitude uh, to both ministries, the Spanish one and the, and the Thai one, for organizing this, this seminar. Uh, it's true that this is my first time in, in Thailand, so I'm very happy. Basically, uh, my experience is based on Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, so it's nice to, to be here. Well, uh, in, in, in Spain or in Europe or all over the world, the, the, the concept of the Indo-Pacific is, 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 is gaining more and more traction. Um, um, when we refer to the Indo-Pacific, you know, we are talking about an area that basically uh, produces more than 60% of the, of the global GDP, uh, that it harbors more than 60% of the global population, and an area you know, uh, where the global trade basically uh, passes you know, its uh, waters, I mean both oceans. Uh, but the Indo-Pacific is, is more than that. Uh, I would say that there are, you know, five, you know, you know, you know, points to, to comment. Um, I see in the Pacific uh, more uh, integrated than ever. So basically, I see a growing process of integration in, in the region. You know, so Ambassador commented that basically now the two areas, the two oceans, are let's say uh, analyzed and seen as one. So I think that they're that are very important. So it's an area more uh, integrated through uh, different mechanisms, uh, human to people, human people to people exchanges, uh, a growing intra-Asian trade, uh, a growing connectivity, basically uh, building you know uh, important you know roads, ports, airports, basically to uh, improve the connection among both ASEANs in the maritime domain and in the, in the continental domain. Um, that idea is very important. So an area more integrated, you know, um, um, and closer. The second important point I want to highlight regarding, you know, the, uh, the concept of, of Indo-Pacific is that, uh, Ambassador commented, and Emilio, is that, you know, uh, the Indo-Pacific is more than China. My wife is from India, so I always try to, de to defend uh, India, but you know, in 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 Asia or in the or in the Indo-Pacific or in Asia Pacific, because we can use different terms, uh, there are rising at least two candidates to be superpowers. One is China, that is obvious, and we can agree on that. 
but the second country is India. Uh, later I will comment something about India, but India is in a clear process of, 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 of emergence. It's becoming uh, politically more important, economically, of course, more important. Um, India is basically improving uh, all the uh, military equipment. So basically, India has some important ideas to, you know, to, to comment later. The third point regarding the Indo-Pacific is, uh, yes, again, uh, is an area of, of competition, and that is the reality, but it's also an area of cooperation. So I don't want to be negative on the future of the Indo-Pacific. It's, it's true that there are areas where we compete, or the different actors of the Indo-Pacific compete with each other, but at the same time, I think that there are possibilities you know, for the different actors in, in the Indo-Pacific, and there are many, that they can cooperate with, with each other, we find basically common you know, necessities. And that is important. So it's more than an area of competition. It's also an area of cooperation. Uh, the fourth element uh, is very interesting, um, as I'll comment in, um, because maybe we in Europe, uh, this is my personal take. Uh, I was born in 1978, um, and my first war, I, I remember the Bosnian crisis in the 90s, the Balkanic Wars, and then the Rwandan genocide. <laughs> Um, and for many people in Spain and for many people in Europe, you know, the war in Ukraine is the, f the first real war. Um, yeah, we have to, ba to, to value peace and we have to undervalue the fragility of peace because probably we are undervalue the fragility of peace. And this is important just to comment, you know, the uh, amount of flash points that we can find in, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the, the, the old ones, you know, basically the conflictivity in the Korean Peninsula between the North and the South, uh, what to say about Taiwan, uh, uh, the problematic situation in the South China Sea, where China is occupying more and more, uh, basically, maritime domain and islands. Um, what to say, for example, in South Asia regarding the situation in Kashmir, that is always explosive, or the tension, the border tension between India and China uh, in, the, in, the, in the border dispute. So basically, there are many flash points that can erupt, and that is important to, 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 you know, to, to pay, so we should pay more attention to this plus points. And at the same time, we have to, or we should pay more attention to the long carousel of non-traditional security issues, the lack of energy, the lack of uh, drinking water, the problems uh, with climate change, the problem with the management of natural disasters, and ETC and ETC. So basically, the Indo-Pacific is facing multiple challenges. And here, of course, because Europe can uh, be a very important actor, you know, in basically uh, uh, resolving or cooperating to solve these global issues. So regarding non-traditional security issues, uh, I mean, international cooperation is the, is the key because there, there, there are no alternatives. And the fifth point regarding the Indo-Pacific as the new uh, geopolitical, uh, uh, let's say, uh, actor, I would say that I think with that we can agree here from Europe, I'm, 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 from, I'm from ASEAN or from, from Thailand, uh, that uh, there is a clear, you know, uh, shift of power from the from the west to the east. Uh, that is real. Uh, when I visit uh, India, when I visit Indonesia, when I visit, you know, Thailand, when I visit the rest of countries in in, in the in Asia Pacific, oh my God, an old guy, uh, I see that Asia is growing. Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, the economic growth, in terms of economic prosperity, in terms of political importance, um, basically. This process of uh, the rise of the Indo-Pacific is in clear contrast, and I, I'm sorry to, to say this, in, in contrast with the decline of the United States and Europe. Um, I, I have that, that is my personal view. Uh, so five you know, uh, key ideas just to you know, uh, basically place uh, where we are regarding the Indo-Pacific. So with this scenario, uh, in my opinion, uh, Indo-Pacific, basically, or the, 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 this new area of the Indo-Pacific Indo is taking shape. Um, in the coming future, we will see the, you know, the, the, the new order of this uh, massive area of, of power. Um, and in this uh, new order, I think that several actors with uh, different uh, motivations, uh, motivated by different drivers, because they will design you know, the future of the uh, Indo-Pacific. Um, my take is, and I agree with the ambassador, of course, is that uh, we are heading to a scenario of multipolarity. Uh, um, I, you know, basically justify my, my thought based on three reasons. First, uh, Asia is too complex to be dominated by one power, so we cannot be so naive 
and try to reduce Asia Pacific to China. <laughs> China, there are, <laughs> there are many countries in, in Asia Pacific uh, with multiple capabilities eh, that can, let's say, confront China if you want. We can elaborate further. Second, I don't see any uh, a country with the capabilities to impose a an, 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 an strategy in the Indo-Pacific on isolation. Second. And third, um, I would like to highlight the, the future role of, of, of middle powers. Eh? When I talk, I refer to middle powers, I'm talking about, for example, uh, Japan, eh? uh, South Korea, Australia, or for example, my dear Indonesia, or why not, what about Thailand? I think Thailand has to play an important role in the Indo-Pacific, basically because it's the natural leader of the uh, uh, peninsula of Southeast Asia, and it's a country with a wonderful you know, history. No? So in my opinion, we are heading to a scenario of multipolarity. Um, there are many actors uh, with multiple agendas, but I would like to comment just uh, some points on China, India, uh, Russia, uh, because it's very interesting, and the United States. Regarding China, I think that we can agree that China is rising, that uh, China uh, has a, a very particular agenda to, to, to be the leader of the, of the region. And regarding the Indo-Pacific and regarding the maritime domain, uh, I would like to, to comment that yes, I think that China has turned you know, uh, to, to the seas. They have a clear policy uh, to basically to exert some kind of influence in both oceans, first in the Pacific, of course in the South China Sea, and as a, as a second theater of operations in the Indian Ocean, and that is very clear. Um, with different motivations, but basically to complete some political goals, that is the Taiwan reunification, that is to conquer uh, using force uh, the totality of the South China Sea, uh, to uh, protect the sea lanes of communication that are vital you know, for, for the Chinese. Um, to do that, um, there is a picture. Um, can, you, yep, can, you, can you put a map of the Indo-Pacific? The next? Next? Yeah, this one. And to do that, uh, I think that China is, well, since uh, 30 years ago, is uh, basically uh, um, elaborate, you know, a, a very calcul, uh, a, very, a, very, a very clear strategy of you know, establishing, you know, points or areas of influence in both regions. This picture is very interesting because uh, Iran is a very interesting political player in the Middle East, but it's, it has a very, it, it, it is in the beginning of the Indian Ocean. It's very, it's a very interesting um, uh, country, um, and China basically is, you know. Uh, creating a web of political allies you know, in the region. Uh, it has a military base in Djibouti. It has a 25 you know, a political agreement or cooperation agreement with Iran signed two years ago. Uh, it has access to the water port in Pakistan. It has access to the port of Chittagong in Bangladesh. It had access to ports in Myanmar. It had access to ports in Sri Lanka, in the Maldives. Uh, it has uh, probably, maybe in the future, I don't know, and here my colleagues from, from, a, from Southeast Asia can, can concur with me, probably China in the future will, will have a Navy base in Cambodia, I don't know. Uh, probably China is building something in the Cocoa Islands in Myanmar. Uh, what we know today is that China, basically a few months ago, well, one year ago, uh, they signed a, a security pact with the Solomon Islands you know, in, in, in the Pacific. So basically, if you see the map, it's very clear eh, that China is expanding eh, its influence from Djibouti eh, till, uh, uh, till the Solomon Islands. So that is very clear, the, the policy. So this is the first idea about uh, China. On India, I'm going to be very brief because we have 10 minutes. I have to get to the point. India is a country uh, that is rising. Sometimes we forget India. I don't know why, but sometimes we forget India. And it's a country with 1.4 billion of population. Uh, with, uh, it's, just in, it's in the top five of the, of the global economies. It's a country, for example, that had the capabilities to develop a domestic vaccine against the, the, the COVID-19. So that is the, the, the sector of biotechnology, a key sector of the future. is quite strong in, in India. Um, India and the Indo-Pacific, you know, but basically they are new friends, I would say. Uh, basically, was during the 40s, during the 50s, during the 60s, during the 70s. The main area of, of concern of India was the continental India. In India, there are multiple insurgencies, the problems with Pakistan, the problems with China in the border. So basically, uh, the maritime domain was not a real area of concern. It was, but it was not the principal. But since the 90s, since the new India is emerging uh, as a new uh, economic power, 
we see uh, an India uh, that has uh, an agenda on the Indo-Pacific, especially from in the Indian, you know, Ocean. So India, in my opinion, has three basic ideas to comment. First, India wants to exert an influence in the Indian Ocean, that is very clear, because they want to be the leader of the region, and it has to be the leader in the maritime context and in the continental context. Second, India, uh, since the 90s, especially with the 1991, um, the Look East policy, India is, you know, it's looking, you know, to, to, to ASEAN, to their Southeast Asia region, you know, to find new allies, to find new economic partners, um, because India wants to be a, a more important actor in the region. And the third step that is far from being accomplished, uh, India wants to be uh, to have a major role in the in the Pacific. So, regarding Russia, and very brief, uh, Russia is very interesting for us, at least for me. For for me, Russia was uh, a strange country, you know, at least my my, my perspective from from Spain. But uh, uh, Russia in the Indo-Pacific is moving, is moving a lot. Um, I would say. Just three things. Uh, uh, Russia, uh, since the 90s, especially uh, well, since the beginning of the, of, the, of the new millennium, with Vladimir Putin ruling the country, uh, Russia began their approachment with, Russia, with, with China in 2001. And in my opinion, uh, Russia has adapted to the rise of India, being one of the most important you know, post political allies of communist China. And that is very clear. So they trade a lot. They trade with weapons. Uh, they, uh, you know, uh, they say both get you know political support, and they are collaborating in establishing a multipolar world, and that is very clear. Trying to erode basically the U.S. role, and that is very clear. Second, and I didn't mention when I referred to India, um, India and, and, and Russia, they have good friends. India is defending the idea of they want to uh, keep a strategic autonomy. Um, to, to get this strategic autonomy and to get a multipolar war, uh, that is one of the goals of India, because they have multiple allies. They have good relationship with the United States, sometimes problematic, but they have a wonderful uh, uh, you know, relationship with uh, Russia. In fact, I always commend this idea, India and Russia, they have uh, um, um, uh, military industry, I mean, they have shared military industry. They are producing hypersonic missiles, the Brahma. So that is very important just to analyze and to value, you know, how engaged they are. So uh, regarding Russia, it's a friend of China. It's playing a more important role in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and for example, in the case of uh, Russia and, and ASEAN, uh, since, again, 20 years ago, uh, uh, Russia is playing a more important role in the, in the, in the ASEAN region. Uh, Russia is the largest uh, supplier of weapons to the region. Uh, Russia has tried to find political allies in the region, especially the case of Myanmar is very important. Russia was the first country recognizing the military junta in Myanmar. Uh, Russia has improved economic ties with the region. And Russia, and uh, this is very interesting, uh, wants to be an active role here in the Indo-Pacific. Why? It's very simple. Uh, Russia considers that the Asia is rising. Uh, Russia wants to be a, a, a global you know, actor. Um, he considers that to be a global actor, he has to play a role in the Indo-Pacific. So basically, the, the case of Russia is very, very interesting. And finally, just regarding the United States, 30 seconds. Uh, I don't want to comment, uh, I mean, big topics, but I just want to comment to two important aspects, or three. One is regarding AUKUS. Uh, AUKUS, uh, you know, AUKUS is a treaty, I don't want to, to comment here, but you know, th there was a, um, a previous you know, uh, step before launching AUKUS that was that uh, Australia decided to terminate you know, the, uh, the deal with uh, France you know, to, to develop, to build uh, the submarine. So that is very important, no? because my, my question is, well, where is Europe here? Uh, yeah, Australians consider that you know uh, the Americans were a better option than 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 the France, no, than France, and that is important. No? So, but where is Europe and why? And the second the second point is regarding uh, the new. Uh, can you change the, the 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 image to the last one? More more? Yes, this one. Uh, the second is regarding the uh, basically the improvement of the uh, enhanced cooperation agreement of defense uh, that basically allow you know. Uh, United States to, uh, to use four more bases in the Philippines. Uh, this is important just to show that the, the, the scenario in, in, 
in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific, is extremely fluid. No? It's, it's, it's moving a lot. You know? And sometimes it depends on political leaders. No? And now with the new government in the Philippines, with Bamba Marcos, well, both governments de decided not to restart you know, their relationship. So that is important. And the last point to comment, and this is my closing remarks, is that one week ago, um, this is, I think it's interesting, United States renewed to uh, uh, yeah, two compacts of uh, the free association with the federal state of Micronesia and with Palau. Uh, what is the meaning of these uh, treaties? Well, basically, that basically allows United States, I mean, allows you know, US military you know, ships of the United States you know, to enter into the territorial waters of Palau and uh, the federal state of Micronesia. Close to one, close to the Marianas, um, basically allows United States to have a wonderful expressways till Taiwan, the South China Sea, or the East China Sea. So to finalize, I see uh, in the Pacific region uh, of uh, steel dynamic uh, with possibilities of cooperation, but I'm realistic and I see that we're in the beginning of a phase of a uh, long contestation. Okay, thank you, Professor. Um, you, indeed, you mentioned um, um, very rightly the, uh, that there are a lot of uncertainties, a lot of, uh, a lot of fluidity, and you mentioned also the, uh, the, the role of the middle powers. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. The um, India emerging as a, as a key player in the Indo-Pacific, and uh, they're eclipsing um, China soon in terms of population and econ economic power and everything. And we see the expansion of strategic theaters, as you mentioned, now to the Pacific Islands, to the um, also to Latin America, where I think um, Taiwan is. Uh, this is the only continent where China is still trying to um, to, to 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 gain access. Um, and, but but it's just a matter of time because uh, Taiwan is losing a lot of allies. Um, Turning now to Dr. Titipat, you are a watcher of major powers. You are a watcher of U.S., China, Russia, and we see, as Ambassador Siasak mentioned, the re reinforcement of alliances. Um, do you think the tension, the current tension, is sustainable? Do you do you see the international, uh, the new international order in the making? Is it bipolar, multipolar, um, and do you think that we can still hold out hopes that? the interests can still be aligned, or are you more um, pessimistic about um, that we are heading towards some kind of really serious conflicts? Can you give your comments? Um, because we see now in Europe, uh, the US talking about decoupling, selective decoupling, de-risking. So what is your view? Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks for having me. Um, as uh, the last uh, panelist, I have uh, actually prepare um, two scripts of presentation. <laughs> uh, since uh, my fellows panelists uh, have explored uh, a tour de force, um, you know, uh, overview of Indo-Pacific already. So um, in order to, to, to answer that question, uh, I might uh, keep it uh, during my, 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 my presentation. So I would like to zoom in and look at um, what I would like to call Euro Europe's, uh, Europe's craft in the Indo-Pacific region uh, from a Thai uh, perspective and uh, our next steps together. Um, as uh, many panelists has mentioned, the Indo-Pacific as an enlarged um, geographical region is framed differently by different actors. Um, it is a highly contested geopolitical concept right now. Um, so uh, following Ambassador Emilio mentioned that uh, you know, the region has been uh, securitized, I would say that the region has been geopoliticized quite a lot. Uh, so we see the geopoliticization of the Indo-Pacific uh, 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 in our era. That is, the region is, is uh, a site of mutual uh, cooperation with like-minded states, but at the same time, uh, for um, the U.S., uh, Quad, and AUKUS countries, the Indo-Pacific uh, is a geostrategic narrative to manage one of the most important uh, geostrategic um, anxieties, uh, namely uh, the rising and assertive China. Uh, this culminates in the lens of free and open Indo-Pacific of four strategies. Uh, in contrast, uh, ASEAN attempts to frame the region in terms of inclusivity and mutual benefits. Uh, the Indo-Pacific is uh, specifically crucial to uh, the EU's goal of securing a stronger Europe uh, in the world, 
And I think in 2021, uh, the EU uh, released its uh, Indo-Pacific strategies. Uh, on the one hand, the um, re-entry of Europe into the region is steered by regional dynamics and uncertainty, in particular, great power competition, maritime insecurity, uh, deglobalization and economic decoupling, tensions on supply chains and technological disruption. Their ramifications directly affect European security and prosperity as well as uh, us here in, in the region. On the other hand, the EU's geographical uh, stretch is related to its potential to play a more active role in the region on many fronts, uh, especially maritime security. Uh, so in this presentation, I would like to, to highlight uh, three or four main points of uh, EU Indo-Pacific uh, strategies, preferences, uh, priorities, and policies, and principles. Uh, so four Ps uh, of EU. But in general, from looking from a Thai or ASEAN perspective, uh, EU ultimate aim is to strengthen comprehensive partnership uh, with ASEAN and Indo-Pacific in, gen in general as well as to build EU resiliency and relevance in the region. Let's start with uh, preferences. I think we, we need to uh, realize that uh, EU with the 27 member states has not spoken with one single voice. Although it has shared a convergence of liberal principles, EU or Europe in general has uh, a divergence of perspectives and preferences. Uh, think about the concepts of Indo-Pacific. There are many visions, guidelines, uh, guideline policies <laughs> uh, ranging from France, uh, Germany, UK, Netherlands, Italy. Uh, we are uh, waiting for a Spain version, but I think uh, <laughs> Spain's uh, support, you know, uh, uh, EU uh, vision of Indo-Pacific, which I think uh, is more comprehensive than others. Um, France, I think, is the earliest um, you know, um, uh, actor uh, that framed Indo-Pacific. Uh, as a resident uh, power in the Indo-Pacific, France under Macron has a different uh, preference in the region, uh, which focus on uh, security and um, defense uh, uh, perspective of Indo-Pacific. Uh, following um, um, France, we have Germany, which has focused more on economic uh, tie towards the Indo-Pacific, uh, like Indo-Pacific policy guidance published in 2020. Uh, European middle powers such as the Netherlands and Italy also declare their own Indo-Pacific guide guidelines. Uh, Italy uh, proclaimed its intention to support the EU Indo-Pacific strategy with the main focus on economic dimension, specifically sources of raw materials and uh, and export market for goods. I think like uh, Italy, uh, Spain has highlighted about uh, this pragmatic approach, free, open, in and inclusive approach to Indo-Pacific, which I think it can uh, provide um, an opportunity to cultivate dialogue with many uh, partners in the Indo-Pacific, including China. Um, with the divergence um, preferences among European uh, members, ASEAN is likely to be interested to hear more uh, whether EU's Indo-Pacific strategy uh, heralds a long-term European presence uh, in the Indo-Pacific, specifically the permanence of presence in the Indo-Pacific in the future. This leads me to, to my second uh, point, main point, uh, about priorities and policies. That's why some national preferences think the EU as an intergovernmental slash supranational organization seeks to prioritize economic cooperation with the region from day one. Uh, EU Indo-Pacific strategy is nothing new. Uh, its economic interests in the region can be traced back to 1994 European Commission white paper, which was updated in 2021. Nowadays, the security paradigms uh, exposed by the EU 2021 strategy for cooperation also emphasizes the significance of EU maritime security and other you know, relevant uh, issues in, in the region. As a global trading, um, uh, trade, uh, global trading power, it is imperative for the EU to maintain uh, a free, safe, and stable maritime uh, environment. And I think uh, back uh, this year in March, uh, Brussels released its new uh, maritime security strategy in order to increase European uh, overall strategic footprints in the region. I think um, 
Thailand and ASEAN has welcomed uh, these uh, you know, policies, uh, preferences, and uh, also parity of uh, EU in so many ways. And I think uh, one way of this issue is about uh, more European uh, naval presence in the Indo-Pacific region in the future. Uh, together with maritime security, uh, naval diplomacy is uh, one way to strengthen EU non-resident uh, Indo-Pacific posture. Nevertheless, prioritization is key to any strategy. The ongoing war in Ukraine has uh, raised questions about EU's priority, especially how the EU plans to strengthen regional economic and defense engagement and commitment. This priority related to time uh, capacity, capabilities, and policy priority areas. This is a trade-off, perhaps, that the EU uh, is going to make urgently with regard to Indo-Pacific and Europe. Uh, EU's visionary narrative eventually has to be supported by consistent uh, practices and commitments on the ground. Otherwise, the EU would run the risk of irrelevance and losing um, uh, effectiveness as an Indo-Pacific player. The last P is um, principles. Uh, rather than following the conventional wis wisdom, I think there are both the divergence and convergence of principles between ASEAN and EU. For the divergence of principles, EU normative power is not fully uh, compatible uh, with ASEAN way of non-interference in internet affairs uh, with issues like Myanmar. In general, the normative power approach positioned the EU as a principal security player Unsurprisingly, the EU normative power highlights its commitment and determination to uphold the liberal rule-based international order and free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, the promotion of the democracy, rule of law, human rights, and the rest are not only crucial to the EU political development, but also as uh, a contribution to the EU long-term strategic interests uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, perhaps the, the fight against IUU fishing as an EU norm is currently one of the thorniest issues in ASEAN-EU relations. However, it doesn't mean that EU and ASEAN are normatively diverging and could not work effectively together. Our event today is one example that we can work together uh, and next year as well. For one, the EU does not explicitly consider China as a strategic threat this threat perception or its lack thereof uh, share a common ground with ASEAN and a number of uh, Indo-Pacific states, as uh, uh, Ambassador Siasak mentioned before. Uh, this is the elephant in, in the room, in the world, that we need to live with. Still, with the AUKUS and Quad looming large in the Indo-Pacific region, there is the uneasy and uncomfortable question of where ASEAN and EU stand in the evolving Sino-US uh, strategic rivalry. For now, uh, we have not perceived China as a strategic threat, but rather pragmatically a strategic opportunity and economic partner with which uh, we should be working together. I'm sure the EU is currently undergoing uh, recalibration with China, culminated in uh, the China-EU uh, Comprehensive Agreement on Investment and uh, Asia-Europe meetings or ASEM uh, process of which merging is part. In other words, despite free and open uh, emphasis uh, uh, to uh, EU Indo-Pacific strategy, the EU, like ASEAN, has emphasized on the inclusiveness of the regional architecture, which should work with all partners equally. Uh, the inclusive address uh, approach is recently addressed at the second EU Indo-Pacific Ministerial Forum in Stockholm in May 2023. Uh, in addition, EU and ASEAN have agreed on uh, non-traditional challenges and concerns affecting the regional stability and resilience. Uh, the four areas outlined in the ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific AOIP uh, are compatible with EU's Indo-Pacific strategy and its main uh, priority areas. These four areas of AOIP include one, maritime cooperation, second, connectivity, uh, third, uh, sustainable development goals, and fourth, economic and other possible areas of cooperation. 
Lastly, unlike a U.S. strategy that is bypassing uh, in one way or the other, is bypassing ASEAN centrality and adopting minilateral institutions like uh, Quad, AUKUS, IPF, and uh, so on, EU has engaged uh, with ASEAN centrality, ASEAN-led multilateral institutions, as well as within the ASEAN uh, process. Despite the EU's norm entrepreneurship, it can cooperate with ASEAN on flexible and pragmatic uh, basis. In a long-term perspective, the EU should address and advocate ASEAN centrality in order to strengthen its comprehensive partnership with ASEAN and sharpen its permanence of presence in the region. Um, against the backdrop of the geopolitical contours in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, the key challenges for ASEAN and EU are, first, how to de-emphasize and downplay geopolitical competition among great powers. That is, how to de-risk the Indo-Pacific region. The term de-risking is widely used during the G7 summit in Hiroshima, Japan, in late May 2023. Second, how to demonstrate and strengthen multilateral cooperation through the existing and expanding ASEAN Center institutional architecture. Third, how to develop the three M principles based on AOIP, namely mutual trust, mutual respect, and mutual benefits. I strongly believe that uh, there are uh, shared common concerns and challenges for EU and ASEAN for the future prospects of the Indo-Pacific region. What is uh, really needed is a joint vision and robust action plan for engagement and implementation in the region. I would like to end um, my, presentation with my presentation with a quote by uh, Mr. Uh, Joseph Borrell, the EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. Uh, he said, and I quote, and I think very interesting that we are sitting together here, the Indo-Pacific region and European Union are neighbors. You will say, neighbors? No, they are very far away. Well, economically, we are neighbors. We are so interlinked that economically, certainly we are neighbors. And not only economically, but also from the geopolitical point of view and from the security point of view, we are very close. Cooperation between us and the Indo-Pacific must be a two-way relationship. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Chichipat, for a very broad, um, again, broad exposition analysis. Um, uh, we have uh, about 15 minutes left, and for the interest of time, I'm going to throw in um, a few questions, and it's going to be a free-for-all um, for the panelists, and then so we can have some time for the, for the questions from, from the floor. Um, from, from what I heard, um, you um, mentioned, a lot of you mentioned about commonalities, compatibilities between Europe and ASEAN, Southeast Asia, in, in, in the um, outlook for the Asia-Pacific, in the uh, strategy for the Asia, uh, sorry, Indo-Pacific. Um, um, I think that's my Freudian slip. <laughs> okay, so I would like to be a little bit of a devil's advocate, or, a, a, or I, want, I want to be a little bit provocative. To, I want to tease out what, what do you think are the, the major challenges or the, um, the obstacles, the discrepancies, the differences between the two regions that might complicate all the projects that we are having together, like we're having an FTA, we're having um, some, you know, you mentioned about digital partnership, energy transition, climate change, cooperation. What do you see um, as the, um, the major challenges and obstacle um, in the context of the changing, the pending changing leadership? coming our way in the US, in the EU, even in ASEAN, there will be generational change coming pretty soon. Uh, the US leadership will change, the EU leadership will change. And how do you see the current situation going forward if you want to, if I want to also de-emphasize geopolitics and 
I just want to mention about policy uh, side of things. How do we survive this erosion of multilateral system more broadly? And when we see countries talking more and more about like-mindedness, we see, does it boil down to ideologies and values? Or can, can we still hope that our interests will align in such a way that we can um, all together um, guide ourselves through these uh, challenges together? Yes, I just want to throw in this broad question. Well, I think, you know, the best way going forward is to anchor our relations on the interests that we have in common. And, um, of course, um, to, we know that the EU believes in shared values of democracy, human rights, but I, I think um, we have to be a little bit flexible how, you know, um, on the, whether you know, we should base our relations on just on these principles. I think we, we have to really be guided by common interests. I, I cite an example. When I was permanent secretary, we signed the partnership cooperation agreement. With, I signed it with Mr. Sullivan, who was the, the, the head of the, the Foreign Service of the Commission at that time. And then we had the military coup. I understand that, you know, that the EU had to react. And, uh, and so that, for more or less, the, the, your reaction to the, the coup and your reaction negated all the work that we done, did on the Thai-EU free trade agreement. So I, I'm saying that, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we really have to anchor our relationship on what constitute, you know, the common interests that, that, that we share. And then, of course, there will be always shifting grounds when it comes to politics. But, but as long as we anchor our relationship on, on concrete, shared interests, I think that's the way going forward. Um, Ambassador Well, uh, I think we must take into account that first of all, both ASEAN and European Union, we are, mid we are middle powers. We are interested in not being abducted by the rivalries between the great powers. And I think the way ASEAN has chosen creating a regional architecture is, I support it because I think it's a very clever way to have great powers dealing through this regional architecture. I think our common interest nowadays is to keep international order that uh, the UN Charter is respected. I think for middle powers is a legality that defends us as protect us. Also, I agree about the importance and of economic uh, interests, but in one point, I disagree a bit with Ambassador Sihasak. Is you mentioned about geoeconomics being more important than geopolitics. In normal times, this is true. But we are not uh, passing through normal times. Nowadays, geopolitics has taken the driver's seat. This is a reality. It's not what we were used. It's not uh, desirable. We would like it to, to be otherwise, but by the moment, it's our reality. Okay, um, any more comments? Brief comments from... Um, yes. yes. Well, basically, a couple of ideas. Uh, first, I think that we, we must uh, attach to, uh, I mean, to economic uh, interests that we share. So that is, I think, the most easy way uh, so we have to find common interests in the, in the economic arena, we have to, to collaborate with each other, and we have to find common interests in the resolution of the non-trade and security issues. Uh, I mentioned in my presentation that is problems with energy, water, uh, 
uh, climate change, uh, nuclear proliferation, and so on. So I think that there, I think we can cooperate and we can elevate our uh, basically our our cooperation. So I, I don't find it problematic. Uh, but we have to be very realistic. Um, and right now, uh, we also have differences. Uh, I didn't mention during my presentation, but we have a very uh, stark uh, uh, view on, on Russia. Uh, Russia is becoming a very, uh, let's say, a relatively important player in, in, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, one of the reasons uh, of this uh, growing, you know, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, presence of Russia in, in the Indo-Pacific is because Russia is not seen as a threat, and Russia has normal relationships with many Indo-Pacific countries. Uh, and to me, and this is very personal, uh, Russia is a threat, Russia is an aggressor, and Russia is committing day after day war crimes in Ukraine. So that's important. So there is a very important political difference between Europe, at least, um, my, that is my personal take, um, and many Indo-Pacific countries, and that is important. So I, I think uh, economic, economics is very important, but, but, but values and ideas, um, um, ideological principles have an important role, and that's true. Uh, I would like to be very flexible on that issue, but anyway, uh, the reality is uh, what it is. And finally, and, and again, uh, regarding some obstacles uh, to promote cooperation between Europe and, and Indo-Pacific, Again, this is very personal. I think that we are too focused now on Ukraine. So, um, and I think that the, the, the political scenario of Europe, uh, we are paying more attention to the northern, to the north of Africa, uh, because it's a wonderful scenario eh, with with a lot of, let's say, uh, threats and vulnerabilities. Um, and we are looking to the east, but I mean to the east to Russia. So basically, I think there are you know uh, present threats that are provoking some kind of distance, you know, with, uh, with, let's say, with the area of the Indo-Pacific. And, th and that is my, my point. Okay, thank you. Um, I think, um, first thing first, I think we might need to distinguish between the reality and aspiration of global politics right now. Uh, I think the reality is uh, that, you know, geopolitics is the reality of Indo-Pacific region right now. It might be a kind of rule of the game that uh, you know major powers are playing right now through, in particular, through the the, the concepts of Indo-Pacific, and uh, it uh, create a kind of uh, problem because um, first it uh, geopolitic geopoliticizes every single issues into um, you know into a competition, a confrontation rather a cooperation. You think about trade war, tech war, Taiwan. Uh, territories, uh, digital, and so on and so forth. So I think this is quite um, you know, challenging. Second, uh, geopoliticization also shaped the kind of uh, context that uh, emerging bipolar system is emerging. We want to create a kind of multipolar Indo-Pacific, but right now it seems to be you know, taking sides into these uh, you know, two uh, big superpowers in the regions and so on. And the third one, it provides a kind of context that uh, many scholars use the term, I'm not sure, misuse or not, but uh, uh, it, you know, this kind of geopoliticization uh, leads to uh, a kind of new core war in, in the region that uh, you know, ideologize uh, issues, okay, and uh, create a kind of distrust, mistrust among each other. Uh, so this is a kind of challenge that uh, we, we, it is a reality of global Indo-Pacific politics. Uh, and second, I think uh, this is the role that uh, as Dr. Valaya mentioned, we might need to address the kind of challenges and concerns in the region like uh, geopoliticization, geopoliticization, structural constraint, and also the problem of trust and distrust in, in the region. Uh, and also another point I think is about in, uh, internal politics that might uh, you know, change uh, the way in which we deal with uh, each other in, in the region. Uh, one last point um, about middle power, I think uh, EU and ASEAN can do together in order to uh, steer the region into a multilateral and multipolar world uh, together uh, through a kind of institutionalization, institutional balancing, or what I'd like to call, we might need to lead from the middle together. Okay, leading from the middle might be a, a strategy that uh, countries, uh, you know, regional blocs like uh, EU and ASEAN can uh, join forces, uh, highlight about rubies, 
uh, international order, regional orders, in a way that um, you know will shape a kind of multilateral, multipolar uh, world instead of you know a bipolar uh, international system. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have only I think two questions um, from the audience. Um, anybody? Yes, please. Yes, over there, gentlemen, over there. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Balaya. Uh, good morning, Buenos Dias, Swadi Kap. My name is Amtiaz Mukbu. Uh, I'm the executive editor of Travel Impact Newswire. I'm actually, I actually cover the travel and tourism industry, so I'm here for the next session, but I just thought I'd pick up on one or two points of uh, the session this morning. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Balaya for giving me the cue of being provocative and also acting as a devil's advocate, which is exactly what I'm going to do. Um, I also want to thank uh, Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Sehzak for one of the best 10-minute summaries of the current geopolitical landscape that I have ever heard. Uh, that was absolutely brilliant. I really want to thank you for that. Um, now, just to pick up on the devil's advocate theme, uh, my question is actually addressed to the two Europeans, uh, the two Spaniards on this, on this panel. Um, the, the issue of uh, mutual trust, mutual respect, and mutual benefits uh, also dates back to the study of uh, history and its relationship with diplomacy. Now, as we know, the Spaniards were one of the four colonial powers that occupied ASEAN, uh, along with the British and the French and the, and the Portuguese. And your history of colonialism in this part of the world with the Philippines was not a very happy one. And the fundamental core of colonialism is the divide and rule philosophy. Um, the question is really, when we actually look at it and compare it to the issue of trust, what is it that you are doing new that actually should, why should this part of the world trust the Europeans and the Spaniards, uh, given the history of colonialism that you've had in this part of the world, and some of the divide and, po uh, divide and rule policies that were used to control uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, particularly the Philippines in, in this part of the world. The second aspect to that is uh, um, um, uh, the professor, uh, Professor Javier mentioned Russians committing war crimes uh, in Ukraine. Well, right next door, the Burmese junta has been committing war crimes for years. So I'm sorry to say, but where are the sanctions? Where are the human rights issues? Why have you not been putting more pressure on the Burmese to do something about this part of the region while suddenly making such a hoopla about what the Russians are doing in Ukraine? So forgive me for asking these provocative questions, but it goes back to that if you want us to trust you, you're going to have to be a little bit more, uh, more fair in the way you impose the rule of law and a little bit more uh, equal in the way you approach your own diplom diplomacy in this part of the world. Otherwise, all we are seeing is more of neo-colonial geopolitization, now neo-colonialism, now known as new name, as geopolitization, and the double standards that applied when it comes to applying human rights in, in Russia and Ukraine as against what's going on in Myanmar. So a little bit of, little bit of fair play would be good order in, in pursuing diplomacy going forward. Very big questions and important questions, but unfortunately we're running out of time. So I think very, very brief um, answers from. I only answer to a part of the question. First to start, you forgot a colonial power in the Philippines, the US. Concerning what was the labor of Spain in the Philippines, ask the Filipinos, I was posted there, and I can tell you, they have good memories of the Spanish presence there. Uh, and concerning colonialism, it's true, Europe was a colonial power. History has a weight, but we must look at the present. Let's see India. Whenever I see India, I don't see the Mughal Empire or the Guptas. I see the present India, the India that has been independent for the last 75 years. So judge the Europeans not so much for the past, but for what they are doing in the present. And the rest of the question is for you. Yeah. <laughs> bueno, one minute, okay? Uh, I'm not happy of the history of Spanish colonialism. That is history that is part, that is part of the past. 
and we, I think we learned a, a, a better lesson. First, uh, second, uh, taking into account that that is the past, we, we, we can, I mean, uh, trust again. So I don't see why the past must uh, basically uh, define our present relationship. First, second. And third, regarding Russia and Burma, uh, you know, for us, you know, for Europeans, uh, Russia now is our more, you know, closer threat. But I read, you know, multiples, you know, uh, basically uh, papers uh, criticizing and, and basically condemning, you know, the current situation in Myanmar, uh, you know, by the European Union. So basically, I don't see any double standard in the policy of the European Union towards Russia and in the policy uh, of the European Union towards Myanmar. What is happening in Myanmar is, is, is brutal. It is brutal every day. And, 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 and I don't see the European Union happy with the situation in, 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 in Myanmar. So I don't, have, I don't see any double standard. I detest both regimes, the Russian regime and the Myanmar regime, and that's all. OK? Yes, Ambassador Dali. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Daly. I'm the ambassador of the European Union to, uh, to Thailand. If you'll allow me, firstly, thank you very much for this wonderful uh, session this morning. And we could go on all day and all night and tomorrow and the weekend. It's been extremely enriching. But just very, very in bullet point form to react to a couple of points. First, question of trust. Why should you trust the Europeans? It has to be acknowledged that in Europe, we have learned the very bitter lessons of our very dark chapters of history, including dictatorship, including colonialism, including wars, and so on. One of the net results of that is the European Union. Why should you trust the European Union? You should trust the European Union because of what we're doing in Europe and around the world. The European Union and its member states are the world's largest donor of official development assistance around the world. EU and member states is the world's largest donor of humanitarian assistance around the world. This demonstrates a European solidarity with the rest of the world. On Myanmar, there are also sanctions on Myanmar. There's a whole history of those sanctions over the, over the, the, the period of the, of, of the coup since uh, 2020. Um, second point, on the EU and the Indo-Pacific, the Indo-Pacific strategy of the European Union is a very clear political statement of intent, intent to engage even further between Europe and the Indo-Pacific. It is inclusive, and if people are confused because there was the French uh, strategy, there's a Dutch strategy, and so on and so on, this is normal business in Europe. It's normal in Europe that there are different ideas of things. People come to the table in Brussels and say, I think we should do this. No, I think we should do that. You can follow that debate, but the shortcut to the resolution of that debate is to see what do we decide to do at the level of the European Union. And that is where you see the EU 27 and uh, its Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. And a footnote, but much more than a footnote, of course, our Indo-Pacific strategy is also one of those which is inclusive, very, very clearly uh, inclusive. EU foreign policy will always uh, reflect EU values. And of course, values and interests uh, go together and have to be, have to be uh, managed. Operational conclusion for Thailand, please have no more coups. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Dali. And I think with that, we have to unfortunately conclude. Oh, um, yes, maybe one more from Ambassador Pradap, and then we have to break. Um. I like the word uh, noble business that Ambassador David mentioned. Um, to me, it's this geopolitic change, to me, is not a business. I mean, uh, at the end of the Cold War, you have uh, only United States, 
Now you have China asserting its power, Russia asserting its power. What's the big deal? I mean, it's, it's natural. They're big countries. To me, it's, it's, it's no problem, you know. And, um, and on top of that, there's a, we are in the fourth industrial revolution. Oil is depleting. All these big countries competing for energy. South China Sea, you don't know what is the real motive of China. Is it energy or is it strategy? I don't know, you know. But um, I, uh, I was reminded of, of King Rama V. How come, I mean, to me, it's not, now it's not ideological fight, to me. Uh, it's just sheer exertion of power, it's expansion of influence. Remind me of the colonial period, King Ma the Fifth. How could we stay independent? Back to, uh, you know, when we in Washington, Ambassador Cesar always tell me what to do, you know. He's, a, he's, a, he's an expert. I just, I just see a senior colleague, and he was there before me, and he always a smart one, you know. And um, I like his word, strategic autonomy. I think the challenge, uh, maybe I like this word from the moderator, how could Thailand, we, ASEAN, keep the strategic autonomy? How could we turn us into a buffer? Let the Russian, let the American, let whatever you, let you expand your influence. How we can stay as a buffer back to the interest? How could we anchor everybody's interest into ASEAN? But ASEAN, as well as Ambassador David mentioned, we, ASEAN, consists of Three, two communist countries, two dictators. I don't know, I want to know about Thailand, but, but uh, anyway, uh, we have a strong band uh, regime, and we have a communist regime, and we, have, and we have a dictator. But at the moment, ASEAN centrality is, is bogged down by Myanmar. But to the challenge, how could we keep our strategic autonomy? How could we turn us into a buffer state and let all these countries just have the, the, the play? And we just keep our own independent and uh, expand mutual interest together. Thank you. Sorry, Ambassador Suwat. Ah, I believe. Ah. <laughs> let, let him have a, let him have a, another question. Okay. All right. Just, just, just yes. Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I will be very brief. I know that's uh, every looking for the lunch time. Uh, my name is Suwat. To make sure that. Uh, I was not smart, well, was not miscalled at the last time for what we have here. Uh, anyway, um, thank you very much for all the panelists. Uh, I just really have one question. Could you talk about the role of China, role of uh, uh, Russia in this area? I just put the forward here for you can check me uh, the, the idea on BRICS, which is I, last week I, I joined with the, this kind of forum, but it's on the Middle East. And we are talking a lot about BRICS because uh, this uh, going to be the new player. And because uh, BRICS, one of the key players is Russia. So this is the why might be, it, to my view, one of their uh, strategy to make encounter of what you have been trying to uh, against uh, Russia. And that might be happen in, in, in Southeast Asia too. With the coming uh, would be government uh, with the expression of the Lord world who involved I have a chance of we talk with them some some of the key uh, planner of their foreign policy one thing that we are talking about is this, uh, let's have our national interest come first don't put the Western value ahead of our international value international interest thank you very much any comments on that? Or but very, I think we have only one or two minutes. Yes, um, for the BRICS, I think um, Actually, they're trying to find a place I to meet right now. What, maybe the question that I have to ask you is which way you're going to vote soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there are many issues that you raise in your question. China and Russia. Some say that China and Russia are in collusion trying to challenge the international order, especially insofar as Ukraine is concerned. And I, I, I don't think that's the correct characterization. You know, China needs Russia. 
but I don't think they're in collusion with Russia insofar as Ukraine is concerned. Because we live in a world where, you know, the, we have an established power that seeks to maintain some degree of dominance. We also have a rising power which, have, which has ambitions to be the dominant power. So, so how, how do we steer this course between you know, the, the competition that we face? I think many countries want to perhaps, maybe there's a third way, third way for, for, for us. And maybe what happened at BRICS represent an effort to find a third way where we, we don't have to be so much dependent or dominated by the two superpowers. We recognize, of course, that, uh, that uh, it's essential that uh, we have good relations with the major powers, but also we recognize that we have to manage the vulnerabilities that, come, that comes with when you're engaging with the major powers. So I, I think many countries are, are looking at that kind of path where we sort of steer, navigate the challenges that, that we face. And m maybe what happened during the BRICS meeting, especially you know, the, uh, talking about you know, trading more, using the uh, respective currency, coming up with a, you know, a, thing, a new currency, a new bank, could be you know, an, a, an attempt to steer our, you know, our way and uh, between the challenges that we face. So that's that. But the, the other point that you raise is about democracy and human rights. You know, we don't have to follow the Western way. It's not about following the Western way at all. I think democracy and human rights is our aspiration. I think it's important. You know, having served uh, at the UN in Geneva, I know that when I'm a democracy, when I believe in, and uh, implement human rights, my, my, what I say carries greater weight. And so it's about us. It's not about following the Western countries. You know? so it, we, and it's, we adopt human rights and democracy, but we seek not to impose these values on others. They have to find their own path as well. And so the, the difference here is that we believe in democracy and human rights, but we don't believe in dictating or telling others what to do when it comes to democracy and human rights. Thank you. Okay, um, the last word, Ambassador. Well, I wanted to ask, uh, to speak about a strategic uh, autonomy that uh, the ambassador mentioned before. The bad, I have bad news, is that unless you are uh, U.S., China, or India, auto, uh, strategic autonomy is not possible. The good news is that if middle powers get, unite, get united, as in European Union and ASEAN, strategic autonomy is possible on the condition that first, we are cohesive. We are constant in our aspirations. We know really which are our interests are on our values, and also if we are able to work with partners who are in the same situation and who are like-minded, as is the case between EU and ASEAN. So I think there is a future for us together in fighting for our strategic autonomy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to extend my thank you for all the audience and to the panelists. And um, I, my apologies um, on behalf of uh, the panelists for eating into the, the time of the second session. I hope we can make up for it by having a quicker lunch. Uh, I think that should make up for it. So thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Um, before ending this session, um, may I kindly ask all the panelists and moderator of this uh, session to remain on stage for group photo for a short quick photo session
ขอบคุณครับครับผม Thank you very much Um, distinguished guests, we will now proceed uh, to the second session of the first Thailand and Spain Forum on good practices of Thailand and Spain in the tourism sector, opportunities for collaboration. Please make a little.